Grab your Bibles and go to Philippians chapter 3. We decided that this November we were going to walk through the Word of God once again together, picking a book and just kind of systematically walking through it, seeking what we could learn and what God would teach us. And, and we've been reading this letter to the church of Philippi, this amazing church that God birthed in Acts chapter 16. If you haven't read it, if you weren't with us for the, for the week that we talked about that, we get to see this church be born. We get to see this guy named Paul who was once named Saul and once was determined to stomp out the movement that Jesus started until God changed his life and he becomes this missionary, this church planner, and he walks into this city of Philippi and he leads people to Jesus. And we get to see those, those first three people, Lydia, this girl with a, with a weird demon-possessed gift, and then this guy who was just a jailer, blue-collar guy that became a Christian because Paul thought that his soul was more important than Paul's own freedom. And he writes this letter to the church at Philippi in the hopes that what God has started among them would keep going because he knows that it's becoming a really tenuous, hard, difficult time to follow Jesus. Anybody want to admit that following Jesus ain't easy? There's seven people that's going to testify today. We got the Christians and then we got the people that just say, there's some people, I am not going to say anything you tell me to say. It's hard to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never had a pastor. To, getting saved, easiest thing you can do. Following Jesus is difficult. It's challenging. Getting saved, Jesus did the work. Following Jesus, especially in a culture that's flowing the opposite direction, that's difficult. And Paul's writing this letter to say, I, I might not make it. Not only might I not make it back to Philippi, I might not make it, period. I may die in here. In the next hour, they could come drag me out of this cell and cut off my head. But I want you to know, no matter what happens, keep choosing Christ. Keep following Jesus. Because it is the best thing that you will ever do. It is the best thing that following Jesus is the only way to live fulfilled and joyful and hopeful. Jesus is it. And I've discovered it. And this whole letter is, is just trying to speak encouragement into these people, trying to breathe life into them so that they keep going. So what God has started among them doesn't stop. And I'm not talking about like, so they just keep growing as a church numerically, but so their faith keeps deep, deepening in a way that's sustainable. See, the church is not the church when it's a mile wide and an inch deep. That there's something about the, the depth, the roots, so that when the winds of life blow, that you can stand. And everything I think Paul's saying in this letter is, 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 is to encourage that type of resilience and endurance. And what he says in chapter 3 might be my favorite. Go with me. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to start with verse 10, because I think everything he says before verse 10 and everything he says following verse 11 is rooted in this idea. Philippians chapter 3, start with verse 10. Paul says, my goal is to know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. That's it. Paul says, you know what my goal is? You know what he doesn't say, my goal is to figure out a way out of these chains. He doesn't say, my goal is to find somebody that comes in here with a bobby pin, because that's how they do it in the movies, and I can be able to release these handcuffs. He doesn't even say, my goal is to get out of here and plant more churches, although I'm sure that he's passionate about that if he happens. What he says, as I'm sitting here in prison, my goal above anything else is to know Christ. Because that is something that, that no one can take from me. That is something that cannot be limited by where I am. That in this jail cell, they're keeping me from advancing the gospel in a way they think I only can, but they cannot keep me from knowing Jesus because he is with me, he is for me, he is right here, and my heart is chasing after him, and no one and nothing can take that away from me. I want to know Jesus. Paul says, above anything else, my goal, the, life, the goal of my life is not to plant churches. That's an overflow of the main goal. 
My goal is to know Jesus. Because Paul had been walking with Jesus at this point for several decades. But I find it amazing that even de- a few decades in to his walk with Jesus, he realized there's more Jesus to know. Testify somebody. You can never know him enough. I don't care if you've been walking with him for two months or if you've been walking him with him for 40 years, there is still more of him to know. The, he, he's like this endless pool. The deeper you go, the deeper it gets. Come on, it's good. I'm preaching today. I'm fired up. It's Thanksgiving. I'm going to eat some turkey on Thursday, fried turkey, the only way you're supposed to eat turkey. What am I talking about? He wants to know Jesus, but this is what he knows, that this pursuit of Jesus does not come without obstacles. That to pursue Jesus, there are always going to be things, temptations, trials, struggles, difficulties that attempt to impede your progress. That if you're going to pursue Jesus, there are going to be things that life, the devil, whatever you want to call it, constantly puts in your path to impede your progress. And if you don't recognize these things, you'll never be able to overcome them. And what Paul begins to do in this chapter is say, there, there are some things that if, you're gonna, if, this, if your goal is going to be my goal, and I think that's what he's saying, the goal for him is the goal for them. That I want to know Jesus, and I'm writing you this letter in hopes that you want to know Jesus too. But you need to understand there are things moving into your life that seek to stand in the way of your progress in faith. So he says, go back up to verse 1. Let's start walking through the chapter. He says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. That's a word that you see frequently in this letter. And again, I remind you, everywhere God is repetitive, he's repetitive and he's redundant with reason. And you'll notice in all throughout Philippians, this this word rejoice is used at least once in every chapter. So circle it, rejoice, because he's talking about this overwhelming sense of unwavering gladness. He says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, when we read this, it doesn't make any sense, but you got to understand what's happening is there's a movement beginning to swell up in that region, in that area, and among the church of people that start to kind of add things to the gospel especially those people that came out of the Jewish faith. And there was this movement to say, no, no, before you come to Jesus, you got you to gotta become Jewish. It's lost Jewish Jesus, then you're good. So, to, but to become Jewish, one of the things that was required by religious ritual and tradition was you had to be circumcised. And so when he's talking about the mutilation of the flesh, he's talking about there's some people going to tell you that, that unless you've been circumcised, unless you've made that transition from lost to Jew, you can never get to Jesus. And there are people that say, we're going to have to make you jump through these hoops to get to Jesus. And, and Paul says, watch out for those people, because those people will weigh down the gospel in a way that will keep you from the one true gospel. And even in Galatians, he says, if you hear a gospel other than the gospel that I gave you, tell those people to take a hike. Paul uses stronger words. I won't use them because I just won't. I'm on film and stuff goes viral. He says, don't. He says, don't, don't, don't get sucked into that because it's a trap. And what it leads to is this, look at me, this performance-based gospel that is not a gospel at all. That you'll begin to believe that your intimacy with God is solely dependent on what you do that you will start to believe that how close you are to God is dependent on all the good things that you do. And you'll start measuring, look at me, you'll start measuring your worth by your works, and that's not how it has to go. Look at me, you don't measure your worth by your works. You don't measure your worth by what you do for God. Your worth is determined already by what he did for you. That you are not, your worth is not determined by what you do. It is defined by what he did for you. And he says, don't, don't get caught in this. He says, if, look at the latter part of uh, verse three, start with verse three. 
It says, for we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. He says, we don't, we don't find our confidence in these things. We don't, we don't draw our security from what we do. We don't get close to God by climbing this works ladder, believing that it will somehow put us in better state. The access to God It's not depending on the things that you do. It's defined by what Jesus has already done. But he says, listen, if anyone, look at the latter part of verse four, if anyone thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. He said, listen, if, if good things and doing all the right stuff and checking all the right boxes could get you to God, I'd have been sitting right next to him because I did it all. Paul says, I fell into that trap. And that's what achievement is. Achievement is a trap. Achievement is a trap. It's a trap. He says, I'm not, and I fell into that trap. Achievement is a trap. He says, I believe that if I did all the right things and said all the right things and memorized all the right stuff and checked all the boxes, that I would, that I would somehow have access to God, that I would be closer to God. And it's so easy to fall in that same trap. And even, and this is the problem with our church. I think we, we've settled that, okay, I know there's nothing I can do to earn my way to God. But then we get saved and we feel like we got to jump all these, through all these hoops to keep it. And it's about our success defining our significance. And the next thing you know, we think the way we get close to God is through what we do. And then we get this sense of arrogance because we do all the right things, and I do more than she does. I, you know what? I've been at church 17 weeks. I ain't seen her yet. <laughs> or we think, you know what? We're starting to fall in this trap. Well, I, you know how much of the Bible I memorized? I can, I can quote every single verse in Matthew chapter 1, soaking the devil. I'll continue to remind you, the devil knows every word in the Bible. Go read the temptation of Jesus. He threw scripture at Jesus every single time. The head knowledge of the Bible does not make you closer to Jesus. If the knowledge of scripture never gets from your head into your heart, you are no closer to Jesus than somebody that's never met him. We're getting real in church for Thanksgiving. He says, no, like it's not about this stuff. And, and don't get me wrong. What we do for Jesus is the overflow of our relationship with him. It's not the pathway to it. Does that make sense? It's not that we, that, we, that we don't sacrifice and we don't serve and we don't do things for God's glory and we don't allow ourselves to be used by him and serve, but that's the overflow of the relationship, not the pathway to it. And when it becomes the pathway to it, it becomes this heart of the motivation is shifted and wrong. And it's more about our glory than his. And, or, it's, or it's more about, well, I'm going to do this because maybe I'll get closer to God and then maybe God will bless me. And it's this really weird prosperity thing that's not the true gospel. That we serve him because we love him and he loves us. We don't serve him because we think that's how we get in good with God or because we want him to bless us because we did something. Well, I've delivered Thanksgiving meals for 16 years. We ain't even been here for 16 years, so that ain't even possible. <laughs> Paul says, I, I, I tried that. I tried jumping through the hoops. I tried checking all the boxes. Like, I tried that. But then look at what he says. Look at verse 7. He said, but now... Everything that was gained to me, I've considered to be loss because of Jesus. More than that, I also consider to be a loss. I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, Now I look back on all that stuff and I realize that everything I thought was great, everything I thought brought me joy, everything I thought brought me purpose and fulfillment, when I look at it in view of now what I get from knowing and living in relationship with Jesus, it doesn't even compare. Achievement is a trap. Do not put your confidence in your accomplishments. 
because it won't last and it's not necessary. Don't put your confidence in your accomplishments. Let me remind you what Paul wrote in another one of these prison epistles to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, start with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is, a, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. That you are saved by grace through faith. And that's why we have to avoid this mindset of thinking that our works determine our worth. And what we do is somehow going to give us the things that a relationship with God can only give us. And then we have to avoid this trap because what Paul begins to discover is actually pursuing Jesus has actually cost him everything. That going after Jesus has, has cost him all the things that he once put value in. But now that he sees them for what they are, he realizes that what he has gained in Christ is much greater than what he's lost because of Christ. Look at what he says, the latter part of verse 8. He says, but because of him, because of Jesus, I've suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung, as so that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. He says, now when I look back and think about all the things that my former life gave me and compare them to what my new life gives me, what I have in Jesus versus what those things were. He says, literally, y'all ready? It makes those things look like poop. It's literally the word he uses. He says, it's nothing. That they're nothing. That, that if you take it in our context, you, know, you couldn't buy enough stuff. You couldn't have enough things. You couldn't do enough works. You couldn't have enough success. Like all those things... I think there was a time that Paul probably was pretty convinced. Man, I got it great. I'm doing all the right things. I'm a successful person. I'm this, I'm that. He's like, but now I know Jesus. And when I look back on what those things gave me and the feeling I had walking in that life versus what I have now in this one, those things are nothing. It's nothing compared to what I have in Jesus. And I'm not going to let myself go back. And I don't want you to fall into the trap of achievement putting your confidence in your accomplishments because it is misplaced and it will not last. And that's when he says in verse 10, my goal now is to know Jesus, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being transformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Like, I want to know all of it. I want to be like Jesus in every way, even in the hard stuff, even the stuff that's painful, even the stuff that's hard, because I know even the hard things are better. The hard things with Jesus are better than the good things from anywhere else. Come on. But then he has this moment of beautiful transparency and clarity. In verse 12, he says, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. He says, but this is what I know as I'm sitting in this cell and I'm looking at my life and I'm examining who I am because when you're stuck in prison and you ain't got a whole lot to do, you can do some soul searching. <laughs> And he says, this is what I've discovered as I sit here. Is I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. I'm not afraid to tell you I'm not perfect. And then he, he even continues in that thought. He says, brothers and sisters, verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it just yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. 
He says, brothers and sisters, I, I realize that, that I'm not there yet, but this is what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna look back because I realize that the only way forward is to forget what is behind and reach towards what is ahead. That I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look back and stand on my success but see, here's the only, here's the thing about the past. It's not just the successes that you have to overcome. It's also the failures. I don't know if you know this, but both success and failure have the potential to ruin your relationship with Jesus. Both are dangerous. Success is dangerous and failure is dangerous. And it, without the proper perspective on both, it will impede your progress in Christ. He's already said, don't, don't stand on your success because it won't hold the weight of your identity. Don't stand on your success. But now he's about to remind, I think he also would want to remind us, don't, don't stand on your success, but look at me, don't wallow in your shame. Don't, don't stand on your success because success, achievement is a trap, but shame is a thief. Achievement is a trap, but shame is a thief. I'm convinced there are people on the side of my voice that shame has stole things from you. It has been a thief of joy. It has been a thief of, a thief of peace. It has been a thief of opportunity because you didn't think you were worthy. Shame is a thief. So when Paul says, I'm not there, but one thing I'm going to do, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to forget what is behind. And what, behind, what is behind Paul is a whole lot of success, but also what is behind Paul is a whole lot of failure. I think Paul would also say, yeah, achievement is a trap. Do not put your confidence in your accomplishments, but shame is a thief and do not be paralyzed by your past. And as much as Paul has this really strong resume of good things that he did that he thought at one time would get him to God, he's also got some skeletons in his closet. He gives this success resume in Philippians, but when he writes to his buddy Timothy, his friend in the faith, his son almost, look at what he says. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. See, Paul says, if I'm going to reach forward, if I'm going to forget what is behind, I cannot stand on my success, but I can also not wallow in my shame. And now I'm one who deeply believes that guilt and shame can be a good thing. Listen to me. Guilt and, I think God, both God and the devil use guilt and shame. Without guilt and shame, you never come to the awareness that you need a savior. Without the guilt over your sin and the shame over the things that you've done, you never get to that point where you're broken enough to cry out to God, to ask him for forgiveness, to confess your sins, see his cross for what it is, and experience salvation. That the difference between God and the devil is our God uses guilt and shame to produce. The devil uses guilt and shame to paralyze. God wants to use guilt and shame to produce conviction that draws you to him. The enemy wants you to use, use the guilt and shame just to keep you broken and bitter and wallowing and not moving forward. He wants to paralyze you. Shame is a thief. That if you're going to move forward and make progress in pursuit of Jesus, yeah, you can't, 
You can't let achievement be a trap, but you also can't let shame be a thief. Can I remind you, Psalm 34, verses 4 and 5, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. That the good news is about our God is he doesn't call us by our shame. He calls us by our name. Isaiah 43, 1. Now, this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. That both success and failure have the potential to impede your progress with Jesus. That if you want to move forward, you got to forget what is behind and look towards what is ahead. You cannot stand on your success and you cannot wallow in your shame. I think we have more of a tendency, and maybe I'm wrong, to wallow in our shame than we do stand on our success. I think about Paul. Sometimes I wonder. Paul, when we meet him, he's dragging people in and out of house churches for their faith in Jesus. And he's seeing to it that some of them are killed. And I don't know how much blood was on Paul's hands before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But this is what I wonder sometimes. Did he ever, on his journeys, walk into a meeting of believers and sit down beside a stranger and look at that stranger and say, hey, um, I'm Paul, I don't think we've met. Only for that stranger to look at him and say, I know who you are, you killed my mom. You drug her out and put her to death for her faith in Jesus and the shame that would have crushed Paul's spirit. But somehow he so believed in the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus that he was able to overcome. And I think if if Paul wasn't paralyzed by his past, I don't have to be paralyzed by mine. I read something this week in a blog by a lady named Amy Holmes entitled Dear Shame. It says, Dear Shame, I've known you quite possibly my whole life, but have just in recent years become aware of your tricks and schemes. I used to believe that you were written on the blueprint of my very existence and that your words, unworthy, were branded on every molecule of my DNA. I spent decades listening to your wicked fiction that kept me shut up and locked down. I was not strong enough then to stand up or fight back, but today I have a few things I'd like to say to you. Shame on you. Shame on you for twisting the truth, for using words that cut straight through the bone to the heart, for feeling like a cold, heavy blanket, and for replacing joy with bitterness. Shame on you for speaking death to the living, for weighing down the lighthearted, for forcing the innocent to claim responsibility, for causing lies to be truth, and for killing confidence. Shame on you for making destruction your life's work, for breaking into hearts and overstaying your welcome. Shame on you for holding the innocent hostage, for destroying even the smallest shred of hope, and for making souls squirm under your red-hot humiliation. Shame on you for taking cheap shots, for bruising the already broken, for the toxic way you distort what people believe about themselves, and for keeping the hurting tangled up in a web of sadness. Shame on you for feeding on secrets, for leaving the abandoned lonely, for silencing stories, for the hanging heads of the brave, for feeling comfortable like a friend and knowing all the while you were enemy number one. Your influence is solely fueled on the insecurities of those you pursue. You rule with intimidation and control lives using fear. But unfortunately for you, your weapons are no match for the infinite and measurable power of my God. He equips us with all the ability to hear past your loud, abusive lies to the still, small voice that patiently and unconditionally calls us by name. 
He is the lover of our souls, our creator, our heavenly father. You see, your filthy, deceitful ways are no match for the marvelous and incomparable works of our God. That the way forward is not standing on your success. And you don't have to wallow on your, in your shame because of who Jesus is. That Paul sits in this cell and he says, this is what I learned. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my peace. Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my life. Jesus is my purpose. That I live my life seated in the mercy and love of the unconditional God that sent his son and gave his life that I might have it. So reach forward and stop looking behind. Would you stand with me? I don't know what you need to do to go forward. Actually, I know what you do you need to do. You need, you need to forget what is behind. But which part of the forgetting what is behind are you struggling with? Is it the success or the failure that's standing in the way? Before we get out of this room, can we do some work? Can we have some conversations with God and let him heal and mend and change? Father, as we worship you now, God, I pray that your spirit would fall among your people. And God, for those who have fallen into that trap of thinking they can work their way to you or think they have to work to stay in your good graces and are so exhausted from trying so hard, God, I pray that you would just begin to offer some strength and hope and deliverance. And for those who are just so riddled with the guilt and shame of the past, things that they've already confessed to you and laid at your feet and asked you to forgive them for, but the enemy's still bringing back to mind. I pray that you would just speak to them as well, God, and just use this time to bring healing and hope to your people. In Jesus' name we pray.